So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a question for you guys. So how many of you know of rheumatology? Oncologist. Uh, like Oncologist. So that's more cancer medicine. Right? Yeah. So anyone rheumatologist? We work with them. Yeah. So I've seen patients who have worked with oncologists <coughs> and rheumatologists. Yeah. So we have a carryover of care. Um, yes. Is it like the study of joints? Yeah. So we deal with autoimmune. And I'll, I'll talk a little more detail about it. So we deal with autoimmune diseases. So anything to do with your immune system. Other than like multiple sclerosis, that's usually managed by uh, a neurologist. Uh, we deal mostly with uh, diseases such as, you probably heard about rheumatoid arthritis, and, and that's an autoimmune process. So we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit more detail. So I want you to, when you walk out of here, I want you to appreciate um, you know, what autoimmune diseases are, what we do for a living. You know, if you have somebody in your family or friends who are struggling or dealing with some joint issues, and don't be surprised, we, we have babies who are born with rheumatoid arthritis. So, so you, you can't just uh, say, oh, it's going to be an old person disease or someone who's over 50, right? So, so I want you to walk out here knowing that, you know, to appreciate and to acknowledge that someone who has an autoimmune process may be sitting right in front of you. And then they need to kind of see a rheumatologist. At least start with a primary care physician or their pediatrician. So, so um, anyway, so um, I work uh, for a group called Ortho Illinois. Uh, we have three rheumatologists in the group. Uh, it's a mainly an orthopedic group where you know the orthopedic surgeon does surgery, uh, but we deal with the joint issues that don't require surgery. Uh, we also work with physical medicine and rehab doctors uh, who deal with the musculoskeletal system. They deal with like more pain management and injections at the spine and more spine issues uh, that we uh, can't uh, work with or they need our support to help manage those patients. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have a slide for that. Um, uh, I grew up in India and I came to this country when I was 18. So I did my high school in India, so I don't know much about high schooling here. But uh, um, I have a high schooler here, so uh, my son right here. Okay. So I know Chris as well, and uh, his dad's a physician. He's an nephrologist, deals with kidney medicine. So I uh, I went to University of Iowa for my undergrad, and um, I did my bachelor's in chemistry there, and I transferred over to University of Oklahoma. Um, and um, there I, um, I did my physical therapy degree. Um, I became a physical therapist first. Um, that was my initial kind of brush with healthcare because I always wanted to be something, you know, like you guys, you know, future healthcare professionals. But you don't know a lot of times, like, well, I, not everybody wants to be a doctor. Some people want to be a therapist or occupational therapist, a physical therapist. So I became a physical therapist. Uh, my grandmother had, uh, both knee replacements, so I kind of work with the therapist closely. And, oh, there you go. So, um, so I work with a the physical therapist closely, and I'm like, oh, this is something I want to do for the rest of my life. So I went to physical therapy school at University of Oklahoma. Um, that was a bachelor's degree at that time. Now it's a master's degree or an, even a doctorate. So it's a few more years. But um, anyway, but that's how the setup is. So. Uh, once I became a physical therapist, I practiced, I came home to Chicago, I practiced for about four years, and then I decided, hmm, I could do more with my life, and I decided to go to medical school. So, um, I actually went to medical school in the Caribbean, so I want to kind of talk about that a little bit. So a lot of times, you know, you want to be a doctor and, you know, folks struggle, because it's really competitive, right? So, uh, if you're super good on your MCATs and your SATs, you may get picked up by medical schools for the six-year program, but I, you know, I mean, I was an average student. I worked hard, and I, um, I went to medical school in the Caribbean, so I wanted to do it real quickly. I was 28 years old, and I wanted to just start medicine and finish it off. So anyway, so I went to Caribbean for about two years. I came back here. I did my clinical um, uh, training, and then in 2004, I uh, became an MD. So... 
Uh, you have to still take the same examinations. It's called the United States Medical Licensure Examination, so you have to finish those. Uh, everyone has to do it. It doesn't matter whether you went to Caribbean or medical school in India or some other place, including here. And then uh, you do your residency. So I did my residency in Kalamazoo, Michigan at Michigan State University program. I did my residency in internal medicine. Uh, that's because, you know, I wanted to do a subspecialty. I wasn't sure whether I want to do cardiology, nephrology, or rheumatology, but I wanted to do general medicine first. Everyone has to do it. Uh, you could go straight into orthopedic medicine. You can go into family medicine. You can go into neurology right out of medical school, but I, wa I was unsure, so I decided to do internal medicine. Um, so that point, um, in my second year of residency, I decided uh, in conjunction with my uh, program director that I probably was a good fit to rheumat for rheumatology because it's all about musculoskeletal medicine, right? So I did my physical therapy. He said that would fit perfectly into your future. So I said, huh, okay. So I did a rotation in rheumatology and lo and behold, um, that was like uh, a great yearning for me. Um, I applied for rheumatology fellowship programs and we have a match system. So I matched, uh, ironically, back where I started, which is University of Iowa. So I did my fellowship at the University of Iowa and I completed that in 2010. So since I've been a rheumatologist, um, and you know, we worked in, uh, I worked in Michigan for about seven years, uh, and then I came here to be with family. So anyway, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, currently, um, I'm uh, working out of Sherman Hospital in a private practice, and I'm also teaching residents at Michigan State University, uh, what I've been you know, connected with for several years and then Rosalind Franklin University, which is a medical school up north, uh, North Chicago. So that's, they have a medical school as well. So if you're ever interested in applying to med school. Um, and so anyway, so that's, you know, that's a little bit about me. Uh, there, I review some disability cases where patients have issues with their muscles and joints and, you know, people who go to work and say, I can't work anymore. And, you know, doctors review their cases and see why can't they work anymore and what kind of restrictions they need at work. So, you know, somebody says, I want back hurts. Uh, it's like, well, okay, uh, if they're lifting, like say 50 pound objects at work, they can't really do that, right? Because they have back pain. So they have to kind of modify their work duties. So anyway, so that I review those cases and make sure that, you know, they're fit for their, for their work. Um, so, you know, I touched on it briefly. So rheumatology <coughs> is a very interesting field. It's a fairly new field. Even though joint issues and um, muscle issues go back, you know, centuries. So the term itself was coined in like 1600s and 1700s by a French physician. But, uh, you know, it goes on to, um, you know, talk about, you know, how, uh, you know, the, the, the muscles and the joints have blood flow. And so these flowing fluids cause disease. Um, so that's what the definition of rheumatology is, right? So it's about diseases where, you know, their flow of fluids, such as the, the synovial fluid, which is in the joints, the, the blood where the immune system works, and that immune system attacks your joints, so, uh, and your other organs. So that could include your brain, it could include your heart sometimes, your intestines, it could include your, uh, your skin, and you know, of course, the, the the toes and stuff where people have people have toes that turn blue, which is called Raynaud's phenomenon. And so you can see it's a head to toe disease process. People come to me when they have exhausted all other kind of sources of diagnosis. So they have seen a let's say a urologist, and they're 25 years old, and they don't know why they had a stroke. So they come to me and say, you know, I don't know. I had a stroke when I was 25, and I've been struggling to figure out why I had a stroke. And so the neurologist will say, hey, Dr. Nan, can you see this patient? Because this, this patient is too young to have a stroke, right? So who gets stroke? Usually it's patients that are at least over 60. So you shouldn't have a stroke at 25. So those are the mystery cases and, you know, puzzling cases that I try to solve. Sometimes we don't find out. It's very humbling. Um, Anyway, so most commonly the bread and butter stuff that we do is joints, muscle, and you know, it's related to the skin sometimes. So I'll show you some slides. And so I wanna just talk about a few terms so you don't get lost. 
Um, and I had mentioned earlier that we, you know, we, we have adults and we have kids that we work with. Um, so I have um, a few patients uh, who are high schoolers um, who are coming in with inflammatory back pain. So what does that mean? So when they wake up in the morning, they have something called morning stiffness. So they, they wake up and they're like, oh man, you know, it takes me about a couple of hours to get going and my back is really stiff and painful. You know, kind of live with it. They think it's growing pains or they think, oh, they play basketball for the high school team and they're having issues with their back because of that. But it doesn't go away, right? So they have to take naproxen or a lead or ibuprofen just to get their stiffness and their pain improved. But when it becomes more dysfunctional for a prolonged period of time, then they come and see me or, or their primary care physician or their pediatrician and say, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, this problem is not going away. So there is a disease called ankylosing spondylitis that happens in younger people. Have you heard of psoriasis? Mm -hmm. Psoriasis of the skin, right? So people, I'll show you uh, a slide with psoriasis on. So, so psoriasis can manifest not only on the skin, but it can manifest in the spine and something called the sacred iliac nerve, where patients have stiffness in their in their in the joint where you know you sit like you're sitting in a chair, your buttocks will start uh, hurting. And you're like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. It doesn't go away. It usually lingers for a long time. And that becomes annoying, and then you're like, okay, there must be something wrong. It's not like you're overweight, but this is called sacroiliitis, where inflammation of the sacroiliac joint causes pain and inflammation. So those set of diseases, um, I'm going to throw a few terms out there, but you know, don't worry about it if you don't know. But it's called spondylarthropathy. Uh, those, those patients have spondyloarthropathy. Spondylo means spine, disease of the spine where there's inflammation causing the stiffness and eventually if you don't address it, it leads to something called bamboo spine where patients become fused you know, in their spine and they're usually by their 40, they're walking like this, like hunchback and motor down, right? So if you, if you uh, get a chance, go look online and see, you'll see like uh, ankylosing spondylitis is a disease that affects the spine and people uh, become fused over time. So anyway, the other uh, point I want to make is uh, vasculitis is something that can occur in the bloodstream where your vasculature is the blood vessels, right? So there's inflammation from the immune system that causes the blood to thicken up and it becomes like, uh, it becomes very uh, uh, inflamed, the vessel walls, and it cl clots up. So that leads to anywhere you can have clotting issues. So it could be a stroke, it could be a heart attack, it could be your fingers and toes turning blue, or it could be also affecting the kidneys where the blood flow needs to be present to keep them going, right? So, so that's called vasculitis, so different organs get affected. And connective tissue disorders such as, you know, you've heard of lupus I mentioned earlier, there's another disease called Shogun where people have dry eyes, dry mouth. So those, those diseases can uh, uh, occur from the autoimmune process as well. Anyway, um, so this is what we do for a living, right? So it takes these many years to become a rheumatologist. So four years is for uh, undergrad, another four years for medical school, three years for internal medicine residency, and two years for a fellowship. So different fellowships have different years of commitment, but rheumatology is two years, cardiology, just basic cardiology is three years, and plus one to two years of intervention where You've heard of people having angiograms and where they put stents and stuff in folks. Um, so that requires, that two changes to like about four. Um, so anyway, so that's what it requires to be a rheumatologist. And then, you know, uh, as I mentioned, most of the diseases are related to the joints and muscles, but we can have different organs manifest uh, via rheumatology-mediated uh, diseases. So... Um, so our job is, in medicine in general, right, is to diagnose the problem and then help patients get better back to their normal functioning. So for example, if I was, let's say, 15 and I was playing basketball just fine, and then one fine morning I wake up and I have this stiffness, let's talk about ankylosing spondylitis, so I have swollen joints and I can't really sh uh, throw the ball anymore, or I, I can't just get out of bed without that pain in my back or stiffness in my back. Now that's become more pathological and dysfunctional, right? So normally I would be able to do that without issues. I, you know, you drag your feet for about a minute and then you're ready to go to school. Here, you can't get out of bed for hours and then you miss, start missing school because of the back pain and stiffness. 
So that's where you know we come in and we're saying, okay, the pediatrician says, I don't know what's going on. You know, I would try to treat the back pain. They get better with the ibuprofen and the leaves and the proxen. They're really not getting out of this whole situation. So that's when the patients come to me for evaluation. Um, and sometimes when you have different organs involved, such as the kidneys or the, the brain, we need a neurologist for the brain, and then we need a nephrologist for the kidney involvement because there's several diseases that may occur at the same time. So it's, it's not just one diagnosis that will cause the problem. Sometimes you can have, just like you can have high blood pressure, you can have diabetes, you can have heart issues at the same time. Uh, in rheumatology, it's the same. We call it overlap syndrome. You can have one disease overlapping with another disease, and that can cause a bigger issue, right? So sometimes we need multiple specialists to help solve those mysteries. So here are some of the common diseases that I mentioned. So I, you know, the most common one that we see is rheumatoid arthritis, where rheumatoid arthritis, or rheumatoid disease, affects mainly the joints, uh, but it can also affect the heart, it can also affect the skin, it can affect uh, uh, people's eyes as well. So sometimes people get eye inflammation, and there's a disease called scleritis where the white of the eye becomes really red. And you know, you'll go to the eye doctor and they'll say, okay, yeah, this looks quite inflamed, this is scleritis but then they give you these steroid eye drops, you put the drops in, it goes away, but then lo and behold, it comes back like two weeks later. I'm like, oh, what happened? I, I thought it was a temporary thing. So that means there is an underlying disease that's actually causing it, and it's not gonna go away until we put you on something long-term. So anyway, so rheumatoid arthritis is now rheumatoid disease, so you can put a little hyphen, you know, disease. Um, we have osteoarthritis, which is a weight and tear form of arthritis, which everyone gets as we get older, where your joints become narrow, and sometimes people need joint replacement where you see an orthopedic surgeon, so it's called a bone and bone disease, right? So you hope you don't need a joint replacement, but sometimes patients need that. So they come to us initially, and then we, we feel like they're not getting better, then we send them to the orthopedic physician. Gout, have you guys heard of gout? Yeah, so, so gout is uh, from uric acid crystals, uh, this, you're probably doing some chemistry, right? So there's calcium crystals and uric acid crystals. Those deposit in the joints, it can deposit anyway, but when they deposit in the joint, it can irritate the, the lining of the joint and cause a flare-up, so where people can't walk. So usually it's in the big toe or the mid foot of the, uh, of the feet. And people have a hard time walking and usually will occur in the middle of the night where they wake up with such severe pain where they can't you know, get out of bed or they're pretty much bed bound and sometimes they have to call 911 to get them out of bed, you know, take them to the hospital for evaluation. Um, so anyway, so that's gout and then lupus you know, is a very, very systemic disease, meaning head to toes. Uh, patients can have hair loss, patients can have heart involvement, People, patients can have lung involvement, they can have kidney involvement, skin involvement, and different. So, so these are all systemic autoimmune diseases. So I'll keep repeating the same terms over and over. So when you go home, at least you have a few terms in your, in your head that you're like, oh, okay, that's what I learned today. Inflammatory back pain, I touched on the ankylosing spondylitis. Osteoporosis, uh, and you'll learn in medical terminology if you learn that osteoporosis is basically means that the thinning of the bone. So as we get older, our bones are not the same what we were born with, right? So our hormones change and the bones change. And patients, if I were to fall down, I may bruise my hip or my bones, uh, but I should not break them unless I fall from the second floor of a building, right? So what happens in elderly patients is that, you know, when they fall down, a simple fall, it's called a fragility fall, they actually break their, their hip or their back. It's called a compression fracture of the spine. And that's automatic diagnosis of osteoporosis. So those patients have to be treated accordingly. Um, mentioned psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. They can go hand in hand in about 60% of patients. A lot of patients will have psoriasis but not psoriatic arthritis or vice versa or both. Um, vasculitis, I touched on. Sjogren's is dry eyes, dry mouth syndrome. And then some patients can have tendonitis like tennis elbow rotator cuff issues, bursitis, there's different cushions around the, the joints in your body where <laughs> patients can get inflammation from overuse syndrome. It's called overuse, where people get tennis elbow or shoulder bursitis or hip bursitis from overuse of these joints and tendons. So this is, you know, if you look at your own hands, you can see there's like really nice creases, right? Um, 
But in this patient, you can see that these creases are gone. So these knuckles are kind of inflamed. So it's not just one or two, it's, it's all of them. They're, they're symmetric, they're both side inflammation. The knuckles that we have here, you can see like, you know, if you dig into them, you can actually go into the joint. Here, these, there's no really joint line that you can see. So this, this is a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. So it takes a little bit of skill to diagnose these patients. Sometimes we have to do an ultrasound, we have to do an MRI, because I can't feel it that well. Because you don't want to, if somebody comes to me, you don't want to miss that diagnosis, right? So if, if they come to you and they're like, well, my hands hurt, you can't say, well, you know, it's growing pains. You got to go the next step and try to evaluate them further. So if you can't figure it out with an exam where you feel somebody's knuckles, and you, you know, if you can't figure it out, get an MRI or an ultrasound to look for it. X-rays don't really tell you much about the joint space itself, but they tell you about the bones and see, and I'll show you. So, so this is the hands of a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. So this is erosive osteoarthritis. So this you'll see in patients that are usually over 70. I'm sure if you look at your grandparents' uh, hands and fingers, you'll see like they have something called knobby knuckles, right? So these knuckles become really prominent. They have bone spurs. And so they cannot make a fist. If you say, hey, grandma, make a fist, they cannot make a fist. They become, you know, they're partially fused. So they can't straighten it out properly sometimes and their fingers are like fists. So it's, you know, it's, we call it a prayer sign. You know, they, if you say, can you fold your hands? They can't do it, so it's like a prayer sign. So anyway, um, and they can't get their rings off. So that's another one, you know, they say, well, can you reduce the swelling so I can get my ring off at least? Sometimes you can't do it because it's already fused and, you know, they have to cut their ring off. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is quite severe arthritis, right? You can see how like it's deformed and anyway. Um, so you can see if you don't control these diseases, this is, this is what happens. But sometimes patients come to you and they're like, you know, I don't know what to do. I said, well, you've kind of waited too long. You should have come a little sooner. And so this is what a normal hand actually looks like. You know, you have nice preserved joint spaces. The, you know, the bones are kind of straight. You have a nice kind of a, a joint space in the wrist area. Um, but here you can see like the joint spaces are pretty obliterated. They're almost fused, right? So this space, you know, um, like the middle finger should have been like this. It's all fused up. And you can see when it fuses up, these fingers become to become crooked. Like they become a little bit deviated, you know, to this side. It's called ulnar deviation anyway. Um, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there's something called bone erosion. So that, you know, that, that immune cells that I was talking about, the autoimmune process, they're eating into that bone right there. And it becomes kind of like a rat bite, like, you know, rat cheese bite. So, uh, so this is what we're trying to prevent. You know, when you come to a rheumatologist, we're trying to prevent these, this damage from happening. Um, anyway, can you guys tell which knee is swollen? So this is right knee, it's left knee. Yeah, so the right and left, right? Sorry, I switched. So yeah, so left knee, you can see there's fluid in that knee, right? So you should have some nice dimples like that. If you look at your own knee, you'll see. But this, this patient has fluid in that knee. So that fluid needs to be drained with a needle. Because if you don't drain that fluid, you know, that knee will be destroyed over time. So, because there's, there's only limited space in that knee and they cannot bend it. Like if you ask them to bend it, they, they can barely do maybe about 30 degrees. So normally you should bend it like 90 plus degrees. So anyway, and this one is, you know, there's a lot of fat pad there, but, uh, uh, but this one has nice dimples there. So this patient, you can see, has fluid there, right? So they don't have the nice dimples. And also have joint space narrowing. You can see that because they're kind of, just like your hands, they're becoming a little deformed. So they're becoming a little deviated. So their leg is moving more outward like this. So anyway, but um, so this is, you know, a knee uh, arthritis. And this is an inflammatory knee arthritis, which is inflammation uh, from whether it's rheumatoid or some other disease. It doesn't have to be always rheumatoid. So this is what happens. I, thankfully, we don't see patients like that anymore because we treat them very aggressively. You guys have seen ads on TV for a drug like Humira, Enbrel, mm -hmm. Rinvoke, right? I don't know if you guys watch TV. <laughs> but, uh, but, but Rinvoke is like this new drug that's in the market for rheumatoid arthritis and many other diseases. 
So those drugs actually work. They, you know, they're expensive, but they work really well. Um, so this is what you see in somebody who's not being treated for rheumatoid arthritis. So their fingers become kind of, you know, curled up and fused. So this is what I was talking about psoriasis, right? So this patient has psoriasis, and then they have these something called sausage fingers. So your fingers become like a sausage. They all become fused over time. You can see how the, the joint creases are obliterated. So they're gone. So this patient has been living with psoriatic arthritis for a while. You know, um, and then and you can tell that the disease is not controlled because they still have psoriasis. So anyway, uh, so when patients come to me, my goal is nice looking skin without any psoriatic lesions and the joints hopefully not looking like that, you know, as normal as possible. I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID and rheumatology. Um, we've actually seen, this is my personal experience, we've actually seen more patients coming to our clinic because COVID is a virus, right, COVID-19. So it stimulated the immune system to cause problems with people's joints, muscles, and different you know, organ systems. So when patients cannot get their diseases in control, let's say COVID happens, and I'm sick with COVID for about 10 days, it goes away, but my problems don't go away, right? So I'm not contagious anymore, but now I have this skin rash that doesn't go away, I have a swollen you know, finger that doesn't get better. So that's called reactive arthritis. So my body reacted to COVID-19 infection. Um, so COVID has, you know, become this new disease entity which has stimulated the immune system. I wanted to throw this slide in there. So I was researching, you know, what's out there in rheumatology and COVID. Not much, actually. There was this initial talk about the hydroxychloroquine, remember? Um, you know, where everybody was gung-ho about this medication, trying to get on hydroxychloroquine, you know, for COVID. But the data is very weak. You know, it didn't really help those patients, but everybody wanted to do it because they wanted to be on the bandwagon for it. So, so what I'm saying is there's a lot of unknown about COVID-19 and how to treat it. What we do is we treat the inflammation, right? So we treat them initially with non-steroidals, such as Aleve naproxen, and then if they don't get better over the course of the month, and I, uh, you know, put them on something called methotrexate or uh, sofasalazine, there's different medication that we use. Um, and, you know, some of the patients uh, with COVID-19 have also gone on to develop connective tissue disease that I mentioned earlier, like Sjogren's and lupus and things like that. We don't know why it happened, but it happened but we still have to treat it, right? Because they have these diseases that are really serious and they can die from it. It carries a high mortality risk of dying. And so those patients have developed lung disease and some of these patients have developed, you know, inflammation of the blood vessels. This is the last one that says giant, giant cell arteritis. And giant cell arteritis is kind of, you know, type of large blood vessel uh, inflammation. So anyway, um, so, what we do, you know, as I mentioned, we do a head-to-toe evaluation because these diseases can be head-to-toe. So when patients come in, I start evaluating, I look at their hair, make sure they don't have any bald spots. I mean, a 20-year-old shouldn't have a bald spot. So then you, you know, ask questions based on that. You look in their eyes, you look in their mouth, you know, you feel a gland in their neck, you listen to their heart and their lungs. Um, you know, you do a full skin examination. <laughs> so it takes me about an hour to examine a patient because you have to be really thorough. You know, you don't want to miss anything. We try not to miss anything. And because these diseases are systemic in nature, they go from head to toe. So that's why you need a head to toe examination. Um, and once you figure things out, we do blood tests and stuff like that, uh, x-rays. Then, you know, the goal is to diagnose the problem, treat it so they can get back to their normal life. And the, you know, and I already talked about imaging and testing so um, um, I think that you know just to summarize I think that joint pain and muscle pain and you know disease manifestation in different organs if you cannot figure out what it is you need to you know see a rheumatologist and providers who can help you get to a rheumatologist um, you need to make sure that you get this done early so you don't get those finger and joint deformities um, and then ultimately, if you don't, you know, if you don't figure out what's wrong, you know, you may need a, a biopsy of the, of the organ 
You guys know what a biopsy is? So where you go is like, let's say if my kidneys are not functioning, the nephrologist will do a kidney biopsy where they'll go in and they take a tissue and they put it under a microscope to see, you know, what, a, uh, what the, the pathology is or the disease process is. Um, yeah, I think needless to say is that, you know, some of these diseases are very complex. Um, they're like puzzles. Sometimes we don't figure out what's wrong with patients. It takes time for us to figure these things out at times. Patients will come to me like, you know, a month later, two months later, three months later and say, what's my diagnosis? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. You know, I don't know what the exact diagnosis is, but we're trying to treat the inflammation and hopefully over time, the diagnosis will declare itself. So, so it's a very, very humbling process sometimes. And I don't, you know, I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, because sometimes you don't know the answer. So, and sometimes we'll send patients to tertiary care center, which is like, let's say, you know, I work in a private practice, I'll send them to a University of Chicago or Northwestern, uh, a specialist as someone who's in academics there who may try to, you know, solve that mystery or puzzle. And anyway, so that's what we do, you know, ongoing basis, patients come to see us periodically, we're trying to figure out what's wrong with them. Um, I'm just gonna touch on a few lab tests. You know, you probably will hear about rheumatoid factor. There's something called ANA. There's tests called set rate, which is inflammation markers. And I'm not gonna drown you guys with all, you know, these uh, technical details. But uh, uh, I mentioned about the medications that are out there that we use. Um, so if you see those medications, you know that you're dealing with a rheumatology issue. And 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 I'm gonna say that you know, and I say that to. Uh, everyone that I speak to about rheumatology is that age is not a factor. You know, babies are born with rheumatoid arthritis. You can get rheumatoid arthritis at any age. You can get an autoimmune disease at any age. You can get cancer at any age. So never let your guard down, you know, trying to figure out what's wrong with that patient. So just because, let's say they're 17 year olds and I say, hey, you know, my joints hurt. Oh, it's growing pains. You don't want to ever say that, right? want to look at that deeper, see if there's any red flags or warning signs, and then evaluate that further. So joint pain can be due to underlying cancer as well. It's rare, thankfully, but you still need to think outside the box. That's what we do for a living. <coughs> um, just want to talk about treatments, and I briefly mentioned, you know, acutely, acutely meaning like if, you know, I have a headache, that's acute headache, I treat it with an ibuprofen, a leave. If a leave or ibuprofen doesn't help, then I put people on steroids, short courses, so they don't get side effects from steroids. Um, if they need medications, we call them steroid sparing agents, meaning we don't want patients to be on steroids long term because they're, you know, um, they can get pretty sick with the steroids. Then we, and I mentioned some of the drugs we put them on, some of these uh, other agents uh, that you may hear about in the future. And then there's some of these new age drugs, these are called biologics that work on the immune cells uh, at the cellular level. They're actually modifying the disease process. A lot of the new cancer therapies uh, that you see on TV, sometimes they're advertising, you know, cancer, Keytrudas and all these different drugs that are out there. They work at a cellular level trying to control the disease. So what's exciting in rheumatology right now is there's a lot of new drugs coming out, which is really, really cool for my patients because you know, they have a lot of options. If you went back 10, 15 years, we probably had about four drugs in our, in our bag or our armamentarium. So now we have about 10 to 15 biologic drugs. Some of them are given IV and some of them are injections that the patients can do themselves. Um, once the patients get better with all these different agents, we send them for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and different types of therapy so they can get back to their normal functioning. So let's take our back patient, for example. Let's say uh, you have ankylosing spondylitis. I put them on uh, etanercept or Zelljans or Invoke, and they feel better, but they still cannot bend forward and touch their toes, so I'll send them to physical therapy to get them more flexibility in their joints. So this is a really cool diagram, right? So if you like immunology, this is what you have to learn. So there's different types of cells that are in their immune system. I don't know, you know, when you go to college, you probably have to do immunology if you want to do medicine. There's always that biochemistry and immunology. But you can see how these different cells, this is called APC, the antigen presenting, presenting cell. 
that talks to this. So they all talk to each other. They're really smart, right? They help control different diseases. So I thought this slide was really awesome. Um, so this cell talks to this cell, this cell talks to this cell, and these cells, when they talk to each other, they actually help kill different pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and stuff. But unfortunately, sometimes when they talk to each other, they talk too much. And then that releases too many of these chemicals. When that happens, the diseases happen. So guess what? The scientists who are working behind the scenes in different labs, they're working on different chemicals to block these. So this is, this is a drug called cyclokinumab that blocks this chemical called IL-17, which is interleukin-17. Uh, you know, and then this drug blocks IL-12 and 23, and that's how they control the inflammation and disease. So I think this is a really cool slide. So I teach this to my resident doctors and you know the fellows also when we become fellow in rheumatology, you have to know this by heart because a lot of our tests, you know, they will ask these questions about where a certain drug works. And so, and you can see like, you know, it goes down to the bone level, that's where the bone erosions happen. And these osteoclasts is almost like uh, these little nibblers that are eating into the bone and they try to destroy the bone. So anyway, so I think this is a really cool slide. Talks about all the drugs that are in rheumatology that eats into it. So here's some of the take home points that you know every patient with joint pain should see a rheumatologist. If you have other issues that cannot be solved by the primary care or pediatrician, should come and see a rheumatologist or another physician uh, requiring that specific specialty. Um, you know, early diagnosis and treatment is really important in any, any disease. Doesn't matter whether it's heart disease, lung disease, uh, skin disease, because otherwise you have irreversible damage, right? So you want to control that. Um, and then once you control those diseases, you know, you can get better quality of life. One thing I want to send you home with is that there's usually no cure for anything. It's, we, we use the term remission for patients, whether they have cancer or a rheumatic disease, they go into something called remission. Cure means that it will never come back. It's been cured and it's gone, right? A lot of times the diseases can something called relapse where they come back, like cancer can come back. You know, uh, if I have brain tumor, if somebody takes a tumor out, you know, gives me chemotherapy, I may get better, maybe in remission, but then 10 years later I can have that tumor come back. So, so now we use the term remission. Uh, uh, not cure, so there's really no cure for these diseases, unfortunately. Um, and that's pretty much it. I think. Everyone, give them a round of applause, please. You guys have any questions? I, I know I I said a lot of terms. I know I've. Um, yeah, go ahead. So I know you were referring to those liquids that build up in the knee. So what liquid is that exactly? What is what? What is the liquid that builds up? So in these the are actually joints? inflammatory cells that. So if I have something, let's say a trauma to my knee, for example, mm -hmm. the body thinks it's like something from outside that, you know, caused something, and then so it'll send these immune cells to the area through the bloodstream, mm -hmm. and it start filling up to protect the joint. Because oh. it thinks like maybe it's an infection, so yeah. it has to go kill it. Right. But sometimes it doesn't know where to stop. Okay. So the <gasps> knee fills up with fluid, and you know, it may eventually go away, mm -hmm. but it's still eating into the joint because that space is limited. So yeah. it destroys the joint over time. So can it fill up with blood or a separate liquid? Yeah, sometimes you can have blood in there too. Okay. You know, it seeps in, and then when you tap it with the needle, mm -hmm. you can see the blood comes out. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can't predict whether who's going to get blood or that, that uh, Just inflammatory like fluid. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, so you talked about psoriatic arthritis. How does, like, if you like, have a psoriasis and arthritis, how do they connect to each other? How do they connect to each other? Yeah, when someone gets psoriatic uh, arthritis. So, Majority of patients who have psoriasis, you know, um, they, you know, they only have skin manifestation, right? But sometimes about one third of those patients will go on to develop psoriatic arthritis. So we don't know exactly how it happens. If we knew that, we'll have pretty much like a cure, right? We know how to treat these diseases, the inflammation component. We just don't know what actually causes these cells to become activated. Why I got it and why you don't have it. We don't know that. Is it a genetic thing? Maybe. But we haven't really solved that mystery yet. So there's a lot of research that is still happening. But it can happen in the same patient. It may not happen in the same patient. But we treat the patient, right? So. Any other questions? Well, thank you.
thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much for your time. And guys, the next meeting is going to be our dissection meeting. So if you want to come for the brain dissection, then you should come for the next one. That sounds like fun. <laughs> it should be fun. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the next meeting. The next meeting is in two weeks.